Good morning. I think we'll make a start. Thank you all for being here. You're very welcome to our service this morning. And if you're watching at home or wherever you may be, you're very welcome in joining us to worship God too. But that's what we come to do, to worship God on this beautiful morning. Isn't it a glorious day? You're probably thinking, a nice day for a picnic or a walk. Pretty well have got to go to church. But no, there's no better place to be than go to church. The neighbors next door were going for a cycle. I thought that'd be nice. But we are here to praise him. That's what we're here to do. Um, just a few announcements. Uh, first thing is that we're going to have a prayer time. Um, a congregational prayer time. For anybody who would like to come along and pray, we're going to meet next Saturday morning in here at 10 o'clock. So um, we'll certainly be away by 11, maybe before that. But if you'd like to join the prayer, we're going to be thinking about prayer later on today. We know the value, um, the importance of prayer. And next Saturday morning is an opportunity for those who'd like to, for those who can, to come along to church, 10 a.m., to pray together. The second thing is, I know I've got a second thing. Next Sunday morning at 11 a.m., we're also going to have communion as part of our service. We haven't had this, had the opportunity to do that for quite a while. But communion is such a beautiful part of what we do as we remember what it's all about. The death, the resurrection of Jesus, the exaltation of him. But so we'll be joining the communion. It will all be prepared in a perfectly hygienic fashion. It'll be slightly different from what we normally do, but we will be doing that. So if you'd like to join us for that service where we'll have communion, that would be really good. Also, just want to mention storehouse. We have the box out there. That we normally contribute to storehouse. If you'd like to do that, let's move from the corner to the front door. Now, I know there was something else I wanted to mention. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, also just to mention, Don and I are going to be away for a little while. We're here next week, but then we're going to be away for four Sundays. You're going to miss us terribly. And that's only because whenever you come back, you've got to quarantine for two weeks. We're going to be over in England uh, with our son and grandson. And uh, then you've got to quarantine. So for four Sundays, we'll not be here. But Terry will be taking the service, and it'll be really good. Um, was there anything else, darling, I had to mention? No, that's it. I should have written it down, shouldn't I, Mark? Um, good. Well, let me read you some words from... Psalm 119. Oh, before we do that, has anyone had a birthday in the last week or in the week to come? Is there any birthdays out there that we'd like to celebrate, highlight, get a badge and pray for you? Any? Alan. Oh, wow. This is great. Oh, and Marion as well. Wow, Marion, this is fantastic. Yeah, good. Well, there you go. Well, here's I've got some badges, and uh, look, I'm going to put it on you from a distance. And uh, thank you. And what does it say, Amy? What does the badge say? Smile. Smile, because Jesus loves you. This is great. When was your birthday, Marion? Uh, come and choose to come in. So we invited to the party. Oh, there's bound to be a party, for goodness sake. Yeah. And there's no point in asking a lady her age, is there? No. Yeah, 21 and 21 and 21. And 21. <laughs> and Alan, when's your birthday or have you had it? The 2nd of September. Oh, gosh, that's uh, Wednesday. Oh, well, one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday. We are going to be partied out. Are you having a party? Not Caroline, if you don't organize something, because I'm free on Wednesday. <laughs> and we could party all that long. No. Okay, well, look, let's, let's pray, and we'll pray God's blessing on Alan and Marion. So let's join together to pray. And Lord, thank you for birthdays. Thank you for life. For that is what it is, a celebration of a gift of life. And Lord, you're the giver of life. You knit each of them together in their mother's wombs. Lord, you knew them before they were born, and you've known them every day since. Thank you, Lord, that they can look back with gratitude, with good memories, and no doubt challenging and difficult times, but you have been their God. Father, we pray your blessing on Alan and on Marion. We thank you for them, Lord. We thank you that they're part of this church where we can know them 
And we pray, Lord, that in the coming year that you will continue to walk with them. Bless them abundantly. Father, let them feel your presence more keenly than they've ever done before. So, Father, we celebrate their lives. We celebrate a birthday. But we celebrate it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was super. Psalm 119. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate, it, I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. And thus we come today to hear God's word, to meditate on God's word, and to be made stronger than our enemies, to be confident to live for him because he is our God. So we're going to lead us into worship. Hosek's going to come and sing. We are here to praise you. Uh, so let's use this as a prayer. So we're going to read some scripture together. We're going to read Psalm 100, and I'd like us to stand. It'll be on the screen, and we'll read it together, this great psalm of thanks, of praise, of worship. So should we stand, and we'll read these words together. Okay, Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. 
Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So let's join together to pray. Let's, let's all pray. Father, your word encourages us to enter into your presence with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise, to shout for joy, to know that the Lord is God and he is good and that we are the sheep of his pasture. So, Father, we have come to you, our God. And we pray, Lord, that as we come, that you will come close to us. We want to hear you speak. We want to hear your voice. We want your spirit to continue to shape us, to change us, to mold us, to become more and more like Jesus. Father, that is a huge prayer, but that is what we long for to be like your son, your only son. So, Father, we come to worship the king who sits on a throne, the one who controls all of history, the one who keeps the stars in place, the one who gives us air to breathe, the one on whom we are completely dependent. Father, forgive us when we think we have got control of our own lives and we don't need you. For, Father, we're dependent on every breath, every beat of our heart, a gift from you. So let's just take this moment's quietness just to bring to him our thanks or a confession, or whatever we would like to say. Let's do that now. So, Father, we come. We come with thanksgiving. We come confessing. We come, we come to you, the one true and living God. Come close to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a reading. Cindy's going to come and read it. Thank you. Reading from Mark 9, 14 to 29. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. 
You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, what wouldn't, why couldn't we drive him out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Cindy. So, for the last number of weeks, we've been climbing mountains. Climb every mountain. And we've been through quite a few of them. Last week we were up Mount Tabor, which was the traditional site for the Transfiguration. And we're kind of lingering up around that mountain today as well, because this is a story straight after Jesus and the disciples come back down into the valley. Remember Peter, James, and John went with Jesus um, um, up the mountain to pray? And there Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as light or lightning. Um, It was a scary time. The disciples were frightened um, and fell flat on their faces. Cloud descended. God spoke, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Those three really important words. So after this wonderful experience on the mountaintop, as frequently happens when you have a mountaintop experience and you come back down to the valley, uh, reality hits again. For those of us who have been on church weekends or a retreat and you've kind of hit a spiritual high, which is really great, and you're there, and God speaks to you and you you feel completely rejuvenated and you come back to real life and it hits you with a bit of a a whack between the eyes. And this is what is happening here. The guys come down the mountain and they find this melee going on. Well, that is what is happening. There's a big crowd of people. When they see Jesus, they're like a bunch of teenage girls seeing a boy band. Suddenly they just go, I don't know if that's sexist. You'll like to say that kind of thing these days. I don't know, but that, that's what it is. They're just, they're completely overexcited. There's this huge crowd. They see Jesus and they're, <gasps> in the meantime, um, the disciples have been arguing. The remaining nine disciples have been arguing with some other <clears throat> teachers of the law. And no doubt they kind of felt um, out of the league. Um, but there's an argument going on, and Jesus, um, Jesus asked them what is going on. But in the midst of all this, in the midst of this excitement of the crowd, in the midst of the arguing of the disciples and the teachers of all, there is a man with a son who's in big trouble. Verse 17, a man on the crowd said, teacher, I brought my son to you who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. Doesn't that sound awful, your son doing this? I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't do it. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Oh, unbelieving generation, who's Jesus talking about? Who's Jesus referring to? He could have been referring to any of them because he was surrounded by unbelief. It was always a major problem. Surrounded by unbelief. Certainly the, the teachers of the law were unbelieving for they were out to get him. Wanted him dead. So they didn't really believe in him. No doubt the crowd was full of unbelief and his disciples. This was aimed mainly at his disciples who had spent such a long time with him, seen him do miraculous things. And still, oh, unbelieving generation. But Satan is at work everywhere. Satan was not just at work in that young boy's life. The spirit inside, the demon inside, messing his life. Satan is at work around the world, 
When we see a story of a demon, we think, well, that's not our normal experience, and yet you just need to look at the world. What's the news to see Satan at work? Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So much unbelief. So the man brings his son to the disciples, desperate for him to be healed. And they could do nothing about it. And why is that? Because previously Jesus had given them authority to do exactly that. And they'd gone out and they'd cast out demons before, many demons. So what's going on? Why could they not do that? Well, we're going to see that in a minute. So they brought the boy to Jesus, verse 20. So they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. This isn't a pleasant sight, is it? Especially for his father. So Jesus speaks to him in verse 21. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? Why did Jesus ask that of the father? Why didn't he just simply... Heal the boy who was convulsing before him, foaming at the mouth, grinding his teeth. Why did he ask a question? Well, one thing we know is that Jesus never asked a question in order to get an answer that he didn't know. But rather, he's asking the Father, What's going on in your heart? Tell me about your pain. Tell me what you believe about me or what you don't believe about me. Tell me something of what's inside. Because Jesus wants not just to cure this boy, but he wants to see the Father made whole also. That's why Jesus came. He wanted this Father to have a life that was full, his heart to be believing. So verse 21, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It's often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything's possible for those who believe. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Take pity on us, he said. Help us. Not to take pity on my son, not help him, but take pity on us. And that's just exactly the way Jesus likes it. It's not just about this boy. It is about all of them. Many people would have come to Jesus looking for something asking for a miracle or for a healing or for a free lunch. People like to ask Jesus for many things. But Jesus always wanted to know what their motives were. Did they simply want what he could give or did they want him? Did they truly believe who he was and what he could do? So when we come to God with our shopping list, the question still remains in Jesus' heart. Do you believe? Jesus said in Matthew 21, if you you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. It's an amazing thing to say, isn't it? And so the boy's father says, if you can help, and Jesus throws the question back to him, if I can help, The problem isn't about me. It's not if I can do it. It's do you believe that I can do it? Everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And so we get to the very heart of the passage. The man opens his heart. He's completely honest. He's not putting on some kind of mask. It is truth not hidden anymore. He's not hiding behind any mask. 
help me overcome my unbelief. The man spoke for himself, but he also spoke for the disciples. For although they were more concerned with their lack of success rather than their lack of faith, he was speaking for them. But does the man also speak for us? Can't we be people of strong faith in some areas of our lives and lack faith in other areas? Can't we say, no, I'm a Christian. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he rose again with complete confidence. I believe that whenever I die, I will be with him in heaven. We can say that with wonderful confidence, assurance. And yet when it comes to other parts of our lives, illness, something in our family, our job, well, maybe our confidence isn't so sure. I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. So Jesus turns to the boy, verse 25. He rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And this is the power of Jesus. I command you. The disciples couldn't do it, but he can do anything. For as we keep reminding ourselves, we can do nothing without Jesus. Remember John 15, verse 5? Whenever I leave this place, the one verse you are going to remember is John 15, verse 5, where Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus said, I command you. Remember the psalmist wrote, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. So is this why the disciples failed? Verse 28, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he said, this kind can only come out by prayer, or some translations, prayer and fasting. Do you know anything about fasting? Know anything about prayer? Just asking. Matthew tells us that Jesus also told them that they have little faith. His version says, they said to him, why could we not drive out the demon? And he said, because you've got such little faith. But Jesus also told them that it doesn't take a whole lot of faith. In fact, he said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, the smallest seed that they could think of, you could say to this mountain, this mountain, the mountain that he had just come down from the transfiguration, you could say to this mountain, I want you to move from here to here, and it would if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. How big is your faith? Is it small? Would you like it to be bigger? Would you like your faith to be stronger? We're all saying yes, aren't we? But you know, mustard seeds, which are very small seeds, can grow into a huge tree. The only requirement for the growth of the seed is that it's in the soil. If it's not in the soil, it won't grow. But if it's in the soil, connected to the soil, then it will grow. So our faith is the same. When we're connected to Jesus, when we abide in him, as he said, our faith will grow. If we're connected to him, we will grow. We will flourish. We will blossom. If we are connected to him, and then all things are possible. But you can read this and you can kind of think, well, if I've got just, if I've only got enough, if I have enough faith, then whatever I want and ask for, it will be done. But that's not what the passage is saying. I mean, it even sounds silly when we say it, doesn't it? Anything I want, if I've got enough faith, it will happen. But no, it won't. It doesn't work like that. A bit more complex than that. And even someone like Paul, a wonderful apostle, who was a man of deep faith, did many miracles, so amazing things happen. But he had this thorn in the flesh. And he prayed to the Lord three times to remove it. God said, no. 
So it's not about just what we want. It's about what God wants. But Paul's faith was deep enough to recognize that God's grace was sufficient. For a mature faith, a deep faith, is the faith that accepts what happens, to know that God knows best. My grace is sufficient for you. And yet God does want us to trust him enough to be bold in prayer and to be bold with the things that we do, the way we live our lives, and to trust him enough to want his will to be done, not our will. Isn't that what we pray? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His will. But faith shows itself in prayer. Jesus said the prayer is essential for this power to be released. That's what he said. This kind only comes out by prayer or prayer and fasting. I wonder what the prayer life of a disciple was like. You tend to think the disciple had a fantastic prayer life, don't you? But I don't know. That night before he died, what were they like? Fast asleep. So I wonder what their prayer life was like. Here they were with Jesus all the time, saw him all the time, saw miracles, heard his words of teaching. Surely their prayer life must have been exemplary a model for us all to follow. It's easy to be a Christian, isn't it, and have a really poor prayer life. It's a really common thing, sadly. And it's easy to fool ourselves into thinking, but that's okay. And we just get on with life, having a really poor prayer life and thinking, whatever. But it's not fine. It's not fine to accept that. It's not fine when you're faced with a world where Satan is causing havoc. It's not fine when a father in desperate need comes to you and asks you to help him. The disciples had cast out demons before. Had they become complacent? Were they too self-assured? Oh, we did this before. This is easy. All we've got to do is the magic words. And Oh, what is going on here? Were they too self-sufficient? Had they forgotten that apart from him they can do nothing? And prayer is a sign that we are reliant on him. This was a lesson in faith, a lesson in humility. For they had forgotten that All the power that they had, all the authority that was invested in them is given by him. They had none of their own. Oh, unbelieving generation. Could Jesus use those words for us? The wonderful thing is that Jesus doesn't walk away from his followers. He said, oh, I'm giving up. But rather, he teaches them to grow in faith and to grow in trust and to grow in prayer. That is what he wants, so he persists perseveres with his disciples and with us. Jesus wants us to grow in every way, in our faith, in our belief. He wants us to turn away from unbelief, just like we turn away from any sin, to say, sorry for this desperate unbelief that I just accept in my life, to turn away from unbelief. That's what the father's boy, that was what the father did, the boy's father did. He turned from unbelief, help me. It was a recognition that he had unbelief in his life and a plea to be helped to turn away from it. And that's exactly what happened. And the boy was healed, set free on the basis of the father's faith, the father's belief. It may have been small. It may have been the size of a mustard seed but it was enough. You and I can do exactly the same. We can let go of our unbelief. The writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Nothing hinders like unbelief. And the writer is saying, let it go. Tempted to sing. Let it go. If it hinders, let it go. Our unbelief is a sin. 
to wait, a stumbling block. Let it go. Of course, you will always have lingering doubts because that is what we are as humans. But you don't have to be hindered by them. You can let them go and believe. And very finally, it's, it's all about obedience, isn't it? And the verse that you'll know really well, we're going to finish on. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. It's a command. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't worry about those doubts and fears inside. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and see what happens. Sharon is going to come and lead us in prayer. Thank you, Sharon. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning just so aware of your perfect love. We come to you with hearts full of praise when we think of how big you are, how powerful you are, how in control you are, and how much you care for us. Lord, we just thank you that you have said that perfect love casts out all fear. And Lord, just as we pray for our world at the minute, for this pandemic that has people bound up in fear, and a lot of it justifiable, we just ask that your love would come into situations, your peace would come into so many different situations with medical workers, with parents sending kids back to school, with people worried for their loved ones. Father, we just ask that you would just draw close to people. And Lord, we just want to remember just people that we know around the world, and we especially think of Cahab Park Church. We think of our dear brothers and sisters over there. And Lord, we haven't seen them this summer. So many things have changed. And we just ask that as they are starting into their autumn program, as they are trying to do things with social distancing, with Zoom, just like ourselves, Lord, that you would guide them and you would help them um, and you would give them wisdom. But Lord, especially that you would draw close to them. Lord, that you would relieve any of those fears. Um, and that you would just really help them to grow in you, to grow as a church, and to fulfill their mission. Lord, we ask the same thing for us here. We ask the same thing for this church, Lord, that as members of the church, we would grow in you. Father, we just think of people that we know who are in difficult situations and we, we think of Joyce, Lee and, and the family. We just ask that you just draw especially close to them at the minute. Thank you that they have the hope of the resurrection. Thank you that they do not need to mourn like those who have no hope, but it's still a tough and sad time and we just ask that you bring your comfort. Lord, we think of baby Lara as well, who desperately needs so many miracles and has seen so many wonderful ways that you have moved already, Lord. But I just ask again that your perfect love comes in, that the fear is gone. Lord, we ask for so many schools have gone back, but so many schools again going back over this coming week. We just pray for teachers, for administrative staff, and for the students and for the parents of students. Lord, another fear situation. And we just ask that people will let you in to their situation so that you can bring peace, that you can calm the troubled waters. Father, we pray for our government as well. Lord, that you would give them a huge amount of wisdom at this time to be able to guide the country well. And Lord, that they would be able to instill confidence in the whole electorate. Um, that they can guide the country well. 
Father, thank you. Thank you that we can bring all of these things to you. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Sharon. We're going to conclude our service. Um, Hosek's going to come along and sing again before the throne of God above. So the words will be on the screen, and let's use this to worship. I think we'll conclude our service by saying the words of benediction. Shall we stand? And like we did last week, we'll look at each other, we'll keep our eyes open, and, uh, and bless each other with these words. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Thank you. So remember next Sunday is communion, um, and then Saturday morning for those would like to come along and join us in prayer. We're going to be here in church, 10 a.m. Thank you very much. <laughs>